Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry question walkthrough. This time we'll be focusing on transition metals, specifically the catalysts part of that topic. And just a quick word, this is a video that was requested by people in the discussion. So if you have any particular topics that you'd like me to cover, then just stick a comment in the discussion and I'll get to them. And as ever, I will be putting my thoughts about the questions in blue and the answers that are actually going to get you the marks, they're going to be written in green. So let's dive on in. Okay, so I've picked two questions for us to have a go at today. So feel free to pause the screen, have a go at them yourself, and then I'll explain my answers. This question is about one of the two different types of catalysts that you need to know about. And it doesn't tell you until about halfway down the page, but this type of catalyst about in this question is the heterogeneous catalyst. And that's where the catalyst is in a different phase or different physical state to the reactants that the reaction is being catalyzed for. And so they begin generally by asking us to state how a catalyst speeds up a chemical reaction. So this is a different question to if you're being asked what a catalyst is, because a catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction without being used up itself. If they're asking you how a catalyst speeds up a reaction, what they want you to say is that catalysts provide an alternative route and that alternative route has got a lower activation energy than the typical route. And so that's all you need to say here for those two marks. And then they move on to ask us how transition metals are particularly able to act as catalysts and specifically in redox reactions. And that property is they have got variable oxidation states or they've got the ability to change from one oxidation state to another and then back again, which is how they actually function. And then they give us a bit of extra detail about a particular process that we need to know about. And this is um, a topic that we need to know the specific equations for, the contact process. They've given us some help here. It's the conversion of sulfur dioxide, which is obviously SO2, into sulfur trioxide, SO3. And there is vanadium 5 oxide as the heterogeneous catalyst in question. Now vanadium 5 oxide means that the vanadium has got a 5 plus charge and since oxygen when it becomes the oxide ion has got a 2 minus charge the common multiple here is 10 so the formula is going to be V2O5 for the vanadium 5 oxide. So that's given us a bit of help in terms of how to structure our equations and maybe we can't remember them perfectly we've now got a starting point because what's going to happen in this catalysis is we're going to start with SO2, the reaction that is being catalyzed, and then the catalyst is going to be necessary for the reactants in equation one. Now, as I said earlier, one of the properties of a catalyst is it doesn't get used up in the course of a reaction, which is odd because it looks like I'm showing that it's getting used up in equation one. But actually what happens is in equation two, it gets regenerated again as V2O5. So we started with V2O5, we finished with V2O5, therefore it has behaved as a catalyst. Now we have to actually just exercise a little bit of memory for the rest of the equation. So SO3 is being produced, and we were told that in the question, but it could have been in equation one or equation two. It's equation one. That's something that you need to remember. Now, the other thing that you need to remember is that the vanadium compound changes. And in fact, all that happens is that one oxygen from the vanadium compound moves across to the sulfur dioxide. And so what we're left with as the second product of equation one is V2O4, which has got the vanadium with a different oxidation state. This time it's plus four. Previously, it was plus five. Now, in any reaction that is being catalyzed in this way, you are always going to turn your catalyst into something new, and then it's going to turn back in the second equation. So here we've produced this V2O4. Now, that's not actually a product of this reaction. What's going to happen is it's going to be produced in sort of stage one, equation one, and then it's going to be reused in equation two. So a characteristic of any heterogeneous catalysis is that the 
products of stage one will be often reused in stage two, and that's how we convert our V204 back into V205. So this is an intermediate species that is made and then used, whereas a catalyst is defined as something that is used and then made. And so now we've got nearly got our full construction of the equations. The only thing that's missing is, well, how can V204 turn into V205? And the answer is it needs to react with oxygen. And so that is our final chemical that needs to be included here. Clearly, this can't be balanced because we only need to add one atom of oxygen in the second equation. And so V204, we need two of them, and V205, we need two of them as well. Now, as a little bit of an aside about heterogeneous catalysts, what you can always do for the two-step equations, like I've shown here, is work out what the overall reaction is going to be from those equations. And so, just like in maths, where you can add equations together simultaneously and cancel things out, the V205 is a product in the second reaction, and it's a reactant in the first one. And so that's going to be able to cancel out. And the V204 is a reactant in the second equation and a product in the first one. So if we rewrite those equations down at the bottom, and if we multiply the top equation by two, if we add everything together that's on the left-hand side and then everything together that's on the right-hand side, we can cancel out anything that's present on both sides. So you can see that all the vanadium-containing compounds get cancelled out, and so we're left with an overall equation which looks far simpler of 2SO2 plus O2 turns into 2SO3. And so that's the overall equation for the contact process, but it does happen in these two equations that they've asked us about here. And then the question goes on to ask us about poisoning, which is a particular effect that can happen to a heterogeneous catalyst during its use. Now, to remember what happens in terms of the poisoning, it's useful to have an overview of what happens in heterogeneous catalysis generally. So I've just drawn three simple pictures and I'm just going to describe them here. So first of all, what happens in the left-hand picture is that one or more chemicals actually sticks to the heterogeneous catalyst at the active site, which I've shown here as a separate colouring. And then, then the reaction happens, that's stage two, and so that can be very, very varied in terms of what the chemicals actually are. And then stage three is that the chemical is desorbed from the catalyst. So we've got adsorption, reaction, desorption. And poisoning affects stage one, because what happens is something gets in the way of the catalyst's active site and blocks it. So that thing is called a poison. And so all that we need to say here is that the poison attaches to the catalyst. And then the follow-up question is asking us, well, how can we limit the impact of poisoning? And the answer to that is simply just to make sure that there aren't any poisons in the chemicals that we're actually using. And so you would say that we need to purify the reactants, which has the effect of removing impurities. And so that's another option that we could use. OK, so this second question is asking about the other type of catalysis, which is the homogeneous catalysis. And they're giving us a, a for instance, and they've said iron two ions, which is Fe2+, plus, catalyzing the reaction between peroxodisulfate, which we've been given the formula for, and iodide ions, which are I minus. And the very first question is actually asking us to define homogeneous catalysis. And that is where the catalyst is in the same phase or same state as the chemicals that are being catalyzed. And then it goes on to ask why S block elements do not usually act as catalysts. Now, this is really similar to the one in the previous question that we did but kind of coming at it from the other angle. And that is because they only exist in one oxidation state, unlike transition metals. And in fact, we could in fact just say, well, they don't have variable oxidation states. And that way we only have to remember one type of answer. Now, the rest of this question is focusing on the specific chemical reaction 
between peroxidosulfate and iodide ions, and it begins by asking us what the overall equation is for the reaction that occurs. Now, iodide, as one reactant, pretty much typically always turns into the same thing in this type of reaction, and that is iodine. That ties in nicely with the halogens topic. And so iodide is turning into iodine, and clearly that needs to be balanced with a 2 in front of the iodide. And so then we need to think what happens to the peroxodisulfate. And it isn't actually as difficult as it looks, because what happens is it falls apart into two pieces, and they're equal sized pieces. It falls into two of these sulfate ions, SO4, 2 minus, twice over. And so that's the overall equation for this particular chemical reaction, and we do need to remember it. And then the question moves on to ask us why, in the absence of a catalyst, the activation energy for the reaction is very, very high. And this comes down to the reactants themselves and the fact that iodide carries a negative charge and the peroxodisulfate does as well, it's two minus. And so because these ions both have a negative charge, or they have the same charge, they're going to repel each other, and so energy is going to have to go in to make those ions come together. Do be careful, we need to say that it's the ions that got charge, not molecules, because this is the only molecule here, and that does not have any charge, so that's a bit of a contradiction. Then we move on to a three-mark question, which takes us deeper into actually how the reaction is occurring. And we've been asked to write two equations, so that would be one mark each, and then suggest one reason why the activation energy for each of these reactions is low. And so, kind of in, like in the previous question, we're going to construct two equations which actually are going to add together to give us the overall equation. So we're sort of coming at this in reverse. We know what the overall equation is, and so we need to work out what these two equations are, which will together add up to give us the overall equation. And that's really powerful because we can therefore work out how these two equations are going to be structured. Before we can do that, what we need to do is we need to work out which of our two chemicals the iron 2 plus catalyst is going to react with. Because we can remember that iron 2 plus is very, very good at turning into Fe3+, that happens readily. And so the iron 2 plus itself is being oxidized by losing an electron. And so what it can do is it can give that electron to other atoms. And I haven't said this already, but this reaction that we've just written out in C is actually a redox reaction. And so we can look at what the oxidation states are of all the key chemicals involved, so that's the iodine and the sulfur. And so the iodine begins as minus one and ends at zero. So the iodine has lost electrons itself. And so we can write that down as another half equation. I minus is turning into I2. Each of those iodines is losing an electron, so two E minus is being lost. And so clearly the Fe2 plus is not going to be reacting with the iodide because both of those chemicals are trying to give away electrons, which must mean it's the peroxodisulfate that is taking electrons. But let's not assume that. Let's write out the ionic equation like so. The sulfur, well, it must have enough positive charge to cancel out most of the oxygen's negative charge, because we can see that overall it's two minus and there are eight oxygen atoms contributing. So eight lots of minus two is obviously minus 16. The overall charge is minus two. And so two sulfur minus that 16 is equal to minus two. So that means that those two sulfurs must be equal to 14, which means that each sulfur must be plus seven at the beginning for its oxidation state. And then at the end, sulfur take away eight is equal to minus two. It was minus eight for the four oxygen or four oxide ions at minus two. And so that means that sulfur finishes the equation as plus six. And so that means that two electrons are going to be gained by the peroxodisulfate. And so what's nice here is that the iodide is losing two electrons and the peroxodisulfate is also gaining two electrons. So it's a two, two being gained, two being lost. Now, we need to be mindful of the fact that the iron is only losing one in the direction that we've shown it here. So we need to multiply those 
all by two. And so we're going to combine the iron two plus with the peroxodisulfate. And so we are now getting into writing down our equation. We are just going to write two Fe two plus plus the peroxodisulfate. Those are our only two reactants because the electrons are going to cancel out and we're going to be left with Fe3 plus twice and then SO4 two minus twice as well. So that's our first equation combined. And then for our second equation, we need to combine the iodide also with the iron equation, but this time it's going to be backwards because the iron three plus is going to be turning back into iron two plus by gaining electrons to do it. And so we need to have two, two and two because that way our electrons are going to cancel out. And so when we write our equation two, we've got two Fe three plus this time reacting with the two iodide and making I two and two Fe two plus. And so you can see that just like in the previous question, we've got iron two plus at the beginning and we've got iron two plus at the end. That makes it a catalyst. We've got iron three plus at the end of equation one and iron three plus at the beginning of equation two. That makes it an intermediate. And so the overall equation, once all the iron containing species have been cancelled out, is two I minus and peroxodisulfate makes I two and the two SO4 two minus ions like we had up at the top in part C. And then the final part of this was to suggest why the activation energy is low this time. Well, it's basically the opposite of why the activation energy was really high before, because this time we are reacting a positive iron two plus with a negative peroxodisulfate and then a positive iron three plus with a negative iodide ion. So these ions are oppositely charged and therefore they're going to be attracted to each other. But actually all we need to say is that we've got oppositely charged ions or positive and negative ions. And then the final question says, why could iron three plus ions be just as effective as iron two plus ions in catalyzing this reaction? And quite simply, we've written this as equation one because we were told to. We were told to show how iron two plus can act as a catalyst, but there is no reason at all why we couldn't have written under different circumstances, equation two first, and then equation one second. And what that would have done is that would have made iron three plus the catalyst, producing iron two plus, which the iron two plus would then be used up again and remake the iron three plus. So what we're really saying is equation one and equation two could happen in any order. And that's all we would need to say for this final mark. Okay, that's the end of these questions. Hope it was useful. See you again soon.